being onomatopoeic with spitting? Yeah, that's a good. That's a good question. You, you, you're a teacher, aren't you? Uh, I was an English major in college. Uh, yeah, I think I think the question, of course, is is what's the significance of Tui's name? Onomatopoeia. Is that how you pronounce that? Yeah. That's that's that. If I remember my English uh, literary uh, tools, that's the uh, the sound of a word that uh, the sound of the word will give you the meaning of it. it sounds like the action. Sounds like the action. There you go. Thank you. Um, yeah, notice that uh, Lois, Lois Cook in the story who says Tui rhymes with hooey, fooey, cooey. Yeah, it's like fooey. Yeah, it is. Um, and I think, yeah, Ayn Rand didn't pick the name by accident. You're right. The, uh, it's, it's, it's like fooey. It's, you know, it, does, it does have some, uh, the, 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 the sound of it has some resemblance to the action of, of spitting. And, and that's, yeah, it's, it's, this is how much. This is how much to we, uh, how, how much moral value to we has. It's it could been, be a contemptible act. Yeah, yeah, it could be a contemptible act. You're right, and 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 Tui's all about contempt. He's about contempt for uh, human uh, greatness. He's about contempt for the human uh, independence and individuality. And he's about contempt for human freedom and the pursuit of happiness. Um, all right. Now here's what I want to do. Chuck, how are we doing on time? We got like 30 minutes. 25. Right, keep me apprised. Uh, what I want to do is plunge into the uh, dramat dramatis personae, the, uh, the, the characters, the main characters in the story, and, and show how uh, the key characters and their actions explain the novel's uh, essence, explain the thematic meaning of the, of the story. First of all, Let's set the time and the place. The Fountainhead, of course, is a timeless story. I think even a casual reader understands that the book is about independence. It's about the struggle between those who function independently and those who do not, those who are, who are cognitively dependent. Cognitive is a big word, just means the way we gain knowledge, the way we learn, the way we use our mind. Uh, and that the, the theme of the Fountainhead is this contrast and conflict between those who are psychologically and, and cognitively independent, the thinkers, and those who in a million different forms are psychologically and cognitively dependent on others. The, the followers, those who in one form or another permit other people or society as a whole to, to govern their, their lives, to, 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 to rule their judgment and, and, and their actions. So the, the Fountainhead is a timeless story. Uh, it, that's ab about this, these profoundly important philosophical issues. But of course, any story takes place in, in a certain time and place. And The Fountainhead is early 20th century America, mostly set in New York City. But, so this is a, this is a very, fitting, uh, very fitting context for it. In New York, we've got the Chrysler building behind me. We have pictures of the New York City skyline here. Um, and, uh, it's early, early 20th century, it's just after the first wave of skyscrapers have, uh, you have been built, in, first in Chicago and, and, and then in New York City in, in real life. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an era in which classicism, that is commitment to the Greek and Roman ways of design, still predominates uh, in American architecture. And it's an era in which modern architecture, the ideas in, uh, in real life of people like Louis Sullivan uh, and Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, and, and, and great innovators like that of uh, uh, just coming in, just coming into existence and fighting. Uh, uh, their, their originality fo forces them to fight a desperate struggle against a conservative society uh, who's used to uh, classicism and, and old historical methods of design, uh, and then that we're not ready yet to, to uh, uh, accept the, the new modernist ideas. So. We're in the early 20th century, and of course, part of the story takes place during, during the Depression, which makes it even more difficult for Rock because the building trades collapse. And one of Ayn Rand's literary principles, which she enunciates in her great book on, on, uh, on, on fiction, the, the Art of Fiction Writing, for anybody who, who, who wants to be a writer or just understand literature, I strongly, str strongly recommend it. It's just the Art of Fiction Writing. Ayn Rand points out that one thing you do one thing you do in a story to, to really make the conflict and the suspense 
uh, more powerful is you make it as difficult as you possibly can for your hero. And the depression is ideal for that. I mean, Rook, has, Rook doesn't have enough to kill against him. His society rejects his new ideas. His, the woman he loves is convinced he's going to be destroyed, so she's trying to hasten uh, his destruction. As if Rook doesn't have enough uh, set against him. And got too weak. This, this evil genius intent on, on destroying him. Uh, on top of that, the depression occurs, which causes the collapse of the, of the building trades, and even the, even the commercially successful architects, the establishment, if I can use that 60s term, uh, you know, the guy Frankens and the Ralston Holcombs are scrambling to try and get, uh, and the Peter Keatings are scrambling to try to get commissions. Rock, of course, who's been made like, into an enemy of society by, by uh, the Stoddard Temple debacle, uh, really has to struggle desperately to get a job. So you make it as hard as you possibly can for your hero. Iron Man throws everything at Howard Rock but the kitchen sink, you know, and she'd throw the kitchen sink too if she could uh, pick it up probably. But of, and, and, and of course Rock overcomes all these obstacles. Now, we've already seen why Rock is expelled from Stanton, the originality of his designs, uh, the, the, the professors and the administrators at Stanton are generally classicists, they're certainly, certainly convinced that the great rules of design have, have all been formulated by the, the architects, the great architects of the past, who are we to improve upon them. Um, and Rock simply will not kowtow to, the, the, to authority. He's going he's gonna to do it, like I said, Rock is the uh, Frank Sinatra of uh, architecture. He's going to do it my way, and he, and, and he does. Now, after his expulsion, he meets with the dean. And this is a scene. That I, that I think we have, we, we have to read, uh, at least part of it. Uh, an English professor of mine in college once, once made a really good point. She said that um, a great writer will give you uh, everything that a novel is going to have in the first chapter. You know, the, the whole conflict will be there, the whole theme is going to be there. You just have to know what you're looking for. You have to know how to logically unpack it. And, well, she's absolutely right in Ayn Rand's case. Everything that's in this book is right here in that first, in that, in that first interaction between uh, Rourke and the Dean in Chapter 1 of The Fountain. The, the, the conflict is there and the theme is there. Uh, another preliminary point, I would argue that if you really want to understand the Fountainhead, there's three critical scenes. Uh, the first one is this, this, the, the dialogue between Rock and the Dean in Chapter 1. The second one is the Manhattan Bank building scene at the end of Part 1, where Rock has to choose between uh, having a major building put up in, in, New, in the heart of New York City uh, with his design adulterated, or stay true to his principles, refuse to compromise on his design, and have the building uh, not put up, and then have to go work on a granite quarry, chooses, you know, to, to not, he will not compromise, uh, so his building is not going to get erected, and we're going to focus on this scene later. Uh, and they said, say to him, do you have to be so fanatical and selfless about it? And Rock goes, what? So they repeat, fanatical and selfless. And Rock kind of pats his drawings to his side, as if he's making love to them. And he says, that was the most selfish thing you've ever seen a man do. The most selfish thing you've ever seen a man do. And it's staying true to his moral principles, even though it's going to cost him temporarily uh, commercial success. That, second, is, is a critical scene. And then the third one, third, third most important, uh, of the most important scenes that we, we need to understand the book is Rourke's courtroom speech at the end for the courtroom dynamite, uh, where he explains, he articulates in explicit uh, philosophical terms the, the, the meaning of the actions, the, the, the meaning that the, the actions have dramatized previously. All right, so let's set the scene here. Rourke's been expelled. Uh, the, the dean, though, recognizes, as do uh, many of the professors at Stanton, that despite Rourke's unruly talent, that he is a talent, and they want him to reconsider it, grow up, come back next year, and uh, come, back, come back after a year, and then be willing to, you know, to conform. Uh, and Rourke, of course, re refuses to do that. Uh, Rourke's going to explain to the dean in this scene why he thinks the Parthenon is not great architecture. The dean says, it's the Parthenon. I'm at the bottom of page 23. Yes, goddammit, the Parthenon. 
The ruler struck the glass over the picture. Look, said Rourke, the famous flutings on the famous columns. What are they there for? To hide the joints in wood when columns were made of wood, only these aren't. They're marble. The triglyphs, what are they? Wood. Wooden beams the way they had to be laid when people began to build wooden shacks. Your Greeks took marble and they made copies of their wooden structures out of it because others had done it that way. Then your masters of the Renaissance came along and made copies in plaster of copies in marble of copies in wood. Now here we are making copies in steel and concrete of copies in plaster of copies in marble of copies in wood. Why? The dean sat watching him curiously. Something puzzled him. Not in the words, but in Rourke's manner of saying it. Rules, said Rourke. Here are my rules. And I would underline this in my text. Here are my rules. In fact, I did. What can be done with one substance must never be done with another. No two materials are alike. No two sites on earth are alike. No two buildings have the same purpose. The purpose, the site, the material determine the shape. Nothing can be reasonable or beautiful unless it's made by one central idea. And the idea sets every detail. A building is alive like a man. Its integrity is to follow its own truth, its one single theme, and to serve its own single purpose. A man doesn't borrow pieces of his body. A building doesn't borrow hunks of its soul. Its maker gives it the soul and every wall, window, and stairway to express it. Now we could go on uh, reading this because it's, it's a brilliant scene, but let's, let's stop right here and, uh, and, and analyze. Let me ask you a question. I always ask, I've been using the Fountainhead as the main text in all my moral philosophy classes for over 20 years now. I taught this book to a few students. Uh, and now by the wonders of modern technology out on the web, I'll be teaching it indefinitely, right? Of course, once AI right, gets, a, gets a hold of us, and they say, oh, we can't put this up on, on the web. This guy's crazy. But uh, uh, what are they talking about? Ponder that for a minute. And the fountainhead's like an onion. You know, it's layers. You can peel off layers. Uh, so I want to start at the surface and then peel our way down to the bottom. At the surface level, what are we talking about here? Anybody? Architecture. There you go. I'm correct. <laughs> Professor Zavarella from NYU. Yes, they're talking about architecture. They're talking about the rules of design, aren't they? They're talking about much more than that, right? But, but they are, are talking about architecture. And specifically, where do the rules of design come from? That's the question, right? And notice the dean has a definite answer to that question. Where do the rules of design come from, according to the dean? Professor, Professor Egan, yes. From the past, from, from tradition, from the, great, uh, from the great architects of the past, from other people, from tradition, by logical extension, since it's from other people, from society, that we get our ideas from others. Now, Rourke, of course, repudiates that, uh, that theory. That's not his school of thought. So notice something right from the start, that from the dean's perspective, Rourke repudiates the only rules of design he recognizes and accepts. So from the dean's perspective, that makes Rourke kind of a wild-eyed, 1960s, dope-smoking radical who's opposed to, to all rules, to rules as such. And by the way, that reminds me of something. A few years back, the filmmaker Oliver Stone, of course, was threatening to do a remake of The Founder. Some, some of you might remember that. I remember thinking about that. I'm thinking to myself, what would attract Oliver Stone to the story? He's such a diehard Marxist. You see it in all of his, in all of his movies, Wall Street preeminently. Uh, but he's such a diehard leftist. What would, he, what would attract him to The Fountainhead? And it finally occurred to me. He, this is my own interpretation, but I'm guessing he must see Rourke as a 1960s kind of rebel suppressed by the corporate establishment, right? Franken's company, Ralston Holcomb's company, the successful architectural firms. You want to keep the man. You want to 